right, Diana, welcome to the show. I'm so, I mean, I was just telling you how excited I am to have you on here because we just watched um, Sacred Cow last night. I've read the book. I've highlighted the book. I've made notes in the book. So a little bit of a super fan over here. Um, But I'd love for you to just start with sharing a little bit about yourself and how your nutrition career has led you to where you are right now and also living on a working farm um, and just, you know, where you got to be and also writing and being a part of Sacred Cow. Sure. Um, I actually had a lot of health issues, which led me to where I am today. So I had undiagnosed celiac disease until I was about 26. Um, And I couldn't believe when the blood work came back showing that I was, you know, my antibodies were screaming about the gluten. Um, I was like, what are you? that's what people eat like three times a day. What are you talking about? (laughs) Um, and, but I had gone to one of the leading gluten-free dietitians here in the Boston area. And she just gave me basically a bunch of coupons for some ultra processed gluten-free versions of what I thought was healthy, which was a largely vegetarian type diet. And, um, so my, my guts got a lot better, but my blood sugar regulation was still a huge mess. So I was like on this roller coaster and constantly had my gluten-free granola bars on me and, you know, just needed to eat all the time. And I felt like I was sort of like on the verge of diabetes, but I kept asking my doctors to test me and they kept telling me I was fine, but I knew that I wasn't fine because if I had gone more than, you know, three hours between eating, I would feel shaky. You know, if lunch was delayed in a meeting, oh my gosh, I would like start having tunnel vision and like a roller coaster, right? Yeah, really that roller coaster. Hanger roller coaster. <laughs> totally. Um, and so uh, I spent a lot of time actually in marketing for natural foods companies. I worked for Whole Foods Market for many years um, doing marketing. And then when I had my daughter who, um, is now 15. Uh, it was just too crazy for me to have like an off arm job with two kids and daycare. And I, I think I calculated I, at the end of the day, I was making like $4 an hour, like between like daycare and gas and <gasps> meals out and everything like that. And so I um, ended up working at the farm for a while, running the, all the front of the house, like our CSA and um, the, the store and doing all the merchandising there and the buying and um, kept getting so many questions about like, why are you selling lard? Isn't that a saturated fat and aren't saturated fats bad for you? And I had been to a Weston A. Price conference because mm-hmm. um, we were a site for a raw milk pickup at the farm. And I was like, what is the deal with all these raw milk people coming in? And why are they eating so much butter? And what's going on here? You know? Um, And I started eating um, a diet that had more animal foods in it. And I started feeling a lot better. I kind of left my low fat, um, you know, mostly vegetarian type way of eating and um, started eating butter and more meat and things like that. And I just felt great. And then Um, I decided to go back to school to study nutrition and um, was really interested in in like a real food nutrition education. And so I did a blend of the Nutritional Therapy Association plus the classic RD education. So I kind of have that mix of both the medical credential, which allows me to take health insurance and work with doctors and prescribe diets for sickness, which you can't do unless you're a dietitian. Um, But I also have that footing in the real food world. So I am a dietitian that will tell you to eat butter and meat and take fish oil and things like that. So um, it really fix my own diet, learning, um, you know, to, to really cut back on some of the, um, you know, large amounts of rice and beans that I was eating and really focus more on meat and vegetables. Um, my, my blood sugar roller coaster ended and my food cravings ended and I just felt so great. And so I opened a nutrition practice, but, um, again, I was getting all these questions about, well, you know, all this meat is bad for the planet. And, you know, how, how can we possibly be eating all this meat? And I was like, well, how much meat are we eating? Are we really eating that much meat? And, you know, no, actually we're not eating that much meat. So as a, as a society, Americans eat about two ounces of red meat per person per day. So that's, 
that's a lot uh, further off from like the 72 ounce steak, which a lot of people envision. And at the farm where I was living, I, I saw how animals could actually benefit the fertility, you know, can't grow great kale without, um, you know, manure and, and animals grazing. And, um, you know, so it turns out that a regenerative farm is actually also the healthiest way to eat. And, and there was such a connection there. And, um, I saw it, but not a lot of other people did because even today in modern conversations about like, what's the most sustainable diet for the global population moving forward for the planet, for everything has to be less meat, less, uh, you know, more, more plants. And, and I think, you know, vegetables are awesome, but I, I definitely question the less meat thing because I think vilifying animal source foods can lead us down a really dangerous road, especially for women and children who are food insecure. Um, and especially in other countries where they don't have the privilege to push away nutritious food. Um, they, they need the nutrients in meat, especially in those first thousand days of life. Um, so as a dietitian, just, I mean, the, the value that animal source foods bring to the table is um, unequaled by plants. You cannot provide the same nutrition in a plant-based diet. And um, you know, and as we talk about larger food systems and what is equitable and what is um, sustainable from a farming perspective, it is is definitely not a plant based diet. It's a diet of of real food that um, has plants in it, but also includes uh, a wide variety of animal source foods as well. Yeah, and I think you know what I wanted to say too, Diane. In the beginning of this podcast, is I want to make it clear to anyone listening if anyone is right, like triggered by some of the things you're saying, if they are vegan or vegetarian and they want to turn it off and they don't want to listen anymore, which that's part of the issue too, right? Is a lot of us don't want to listen, right? You, you're not saying, and in the book, you guys aren't saying either. We're not saying take away vegetables or less vegetables. It's just saying, let's not take away the meat. There's room for it all there. And also too, and this is, you know, this is what the book promotes, but it's making a a case for better meat, right? And talking about pasture raised meat. We're not talking about and promoting industrial or factory farmed meat. And we'll get into all that. Um, but it's again, yeah, it's making that case for better meat and all the things it can do for us. And, you know, I want to get into kind of the three sections that you guys outline in the book. We have the nutrition piece of it, um, the environmental piece, and then the ethics piece, which I think is where most people's questions lie. And even just starting with the nutrition piece, and that's where I want to dive in first, but uh, your story, and I'm sure with some people listening, resonates so much with me because I've had clients, I've had um, you know, friends, family members who have tried a more vegetarian lifestyle and they just don't feel good. And then once they start adding that meat back in, or like you said, their blood sugars all of a sudden start going out of whack and they're constantly hungry. So there's so much to be said about, you know, the satiating part of meat. And I mean, we could go on and on with the list of what protein actually does for us, but I'm curious what you think are the biggest, you know, parts of nutrition in terms of the myths that we want to debunk, but then mm -hmm. in terms of what protein and eating these high quality pasture raised meats, um, can do for us from a nutrition standpoint. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I think that I always advocate that people should just get the best meat they can access to because yes. you have to meet True. people where they are. And, yep. um, you know, regenerative meat is a very small percentage of the meat that's produced. And so, um, so when people say, you know, uh, less meat, better meat, I actually, it, that triggers me a little bit just from a food equity perspective, because yeah. there are a lot of people, you know, I mean, when we, when we looked at the nutrition differences in red meat, so there's differences in other foods, like in fish, there's differences between farm raised salmon, like major differences between wild and farm raised, um, in poultry, there's differences in eggs and even in dairy, there are major differences, but when we're looking at steak, 
we're not seeing massive, massive nutrition differences between um, a, a steak that spent the last few months of its life on a feedlot versus a steak that was finished on grass. Um, and that has to do, number one, with all cattle spending the majority of their life on grass, no matter how they're finished, which a lot of people don't know that, you know, they think that, well, you know, industrial bad CAFO meat is just evil 100%. And it's actually, you know, we weren't able to find in the literature any evidence of antibiotic residue or glyphosate re residue or, um, you know, any difference in the proteins between, between that. The difference is really in the fats and it's not a major difference when we talk about steak. Um, so that was the biggest revelation that we had when we were making the book because we really did, we spent four years writing this book and we wanted to be as evidence-based and sort of unbiased and questioning ourselves as possible, like all scientists really should do. Um, and, and what it comes down to is that red meat is a nutrient-dense food, period. It's, it's more nutrient-dense than chicken and pork, um, Seafood is, is actually secretly my favorite food um, and, and actually has a lot more, you know, I think someone can be really healthy if they choose not to eat red meat and just go for fish, but that doesn't mean that their diet is less harm. It doesn't mean that their diet is more pure or anything like that because, um, you know, uh, Americans don't eat a lot of fish and um, it's not as sustainable for a lot of people to access, right? And it's, it, it can be really expensive. For people to yeah. eat a diet of just fish um, for their protein. But um, so as far as, you know, there's a lot of myths around meat, it causes cancer, it causes heart disease. I've heard that it causes diabetes. I don't understand how that one's possible. <laughs> um, but uh, basically it's all based on really bad science that's doing um, looking at observational studies, which just com compare one population to another and then try to tease out the differences in you know, did they eat meat or not? And uh, people lie on food frequency questionnaires. They can never remember what they ate last month, let alone the, you know, the yeah. day before, um, you know, so many of my nutrition clients, I'm like, okay, walk me through yesterday. What'd you eat? And almost nobody can ever tell me. Um, yeah. Even when they write it down, they, they, they'll be like, oh, I think I wrote it down, but I have no idea what I ate yesterday. Um, so people lie, um, there, uh, there are a lot of what we call confounding factors, um, between lifestyles of people who are typical vegetarians versus your typical American omnivore, you know? Um, so is it really the meat that someone's eating or all the ultra processed oils, the French fries, the bun, the, you know, yep. all the other stuff that's going along, along with a typical, um, standard American diet versus somebody who shops at a health food store and does yoga mm -hmm. and all that. And so in the studies where they have looked at shoppers at health food stores, they found absolutely no difference at all in longevity between omnivores and vegetarians. Um, so that, you know, and the health food store thing kind of adjusts a little bit more for, you know, a similar lifestyle. Uh, and so, you know, when, as a dietitian, if you're just looking at nutrients, if, um, and that's what I try to break it down to at the end of the book, I have a, a challenge. Um, and actually I'm going to have a course up pretty soon called eat like a Nutrivore. Oh, I um, love it. Where we just, you know, have people log their food into an app that, um, shows the micronutrients. So all the vitamins and minerals that they're getting, and just, just show me, just show me a day where you're eating, you know, a reasonable amount of calories, 1500, 2000 calories, um, what's your nutrient intake? Like, let's yeah. take emotion completely out of it and just show me, you know, you can't win if you're not eating, you know, some form of like oysters or liver or, you know, animal source foods. It's just really, really hard to get the right amount of protein and the right, um, you know, the, the DRI of, uh, vitamins and minerals without animal source foods in there. And, you know, whenever they've studied, um, uh, meat versus less meat in children, the meat groups always outperform the less meat groups. Um, and yeah. so those experimental studies are the ones we should be looking at, not these large observational studies that are actually just showing researcher bias. Well, and that's what, you know, people see the headline, right? Red meat causes cancer or meat causes cancer. And it, there's so much more to the story. And, it, you know, it frustrates, which I'm sure you feel the same way, Diana, but it frustrates me because then, yes, when you actually look at the studies and you see that it's all based on food frequency questionnaires. And um, one thing I always like to point out to people, well, even when they're just scared of like saturated fat, 
where the real issue lies is when you pair, like you said, with, you know, those ultra processed foods, but when you pair that saturated fat with high carbohydrate processed foods, that's when you run into health issues. It's not even just like the saturated fat alone. So that's, I mean, that's one thing that I, I think is going to unfortunately take years to debunk and people will probably still be scared of saturated fat. But if we can at least get people to understand how nutrient dense most proteins are, but particularly I'm a huge red meat advocate. And I also noticed too, part of it being is just seeing how much better I feel or how my clients feel when they add it in a, you know, a few times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I mean, for me too, I, I just love the flavor as well. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, do you have a recommendation for your clients? And obviously everyone's individualized. I know for my clients, I have a general recommendation, but how much protein should people be aiming for at each, at each meal? Well, uh, on a daily level, I usually just start at double the RDA. So 1.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight, um, which is twice as much as the RDA recommends, but the RDA recommendations, I looked back on, on how they formed them and, um, you know, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is the minimum, not the optimal amount, the minimum to avoid muscle loss. And, um, because Americans don't like to calculate kilograms or calculate grams per kilogram, (laughs) um, the calculations have been done for us and they're based on this ideal body weight for a woman of 125 pounds and for a man of 154 pounds. Um, and so that's where you see these numbers that women only need 45 grams of protein per day and men only need 54 grams of protein per day or something like that. And, um, that is not the average weight of Americans. It's way off. Uh, and so if you do look at the average weight of Americans, even the minimum, um, recommendation of, uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram is almost hundred grams of protein per day, which is where I recommend almost all people just start. So what does that look like? You know, if we take that 30 grams per meal, yeah, that's, way more protein than any client is eating that comes in to see me. Um, Agreed. That's, that's actually my recommendation as well. It's like 30 grams. If you can't get to 30, give me 25 at least, you know, and then have your snacks in between that are all protein rich. Mm -hmm. Um, And women in particular just have a really hard time. We're taught that we should be eating salads that, um, you know, too much meat is gluttonous, that it's, it's, um, wasteful and it's barbaric, you know, all these things. Um, and so when I'm out and I order a steak and whoever I'm with who of the other gender is ordering chicken or fish, I'm always served the chicken or fish. Like it's, it's just assumed that the man is the one getting the red meat. Yeah. Um, and so I think we, as women need to really take that back and, um, be a lot more pro meat than we have been. Usually men, um, when I tell them to eat more meat, they're just like sold period, like running out the door, you know, where can I get a steak? And women generally, you know, by the second consult that I'm having with them, when they weigh up their protein, they're beaming, like so, yeah. so happy. Their vitality is back They're They feel full. I mean, so that's one of the huge benefits is just the satiation that they get from eating more protein because it is the most satiating macronutrient. And so if I did nothing else, if people continued to drink soda and eat candy and, and, and all the things, if I just tell them to eat more protein, they will automatically eat less. It's, it's the protein leverage hypothesis. Um, we, protein is so satiating and, and also that those nutrients are also um, ending cravings too, right? Like, it, like yeah. we don't just crave protein, but we're also craving B12. We're craving mm-hmm. selenium, you know, all the things that um, we're not getting through ultra processed foods. And so when you're actually giving your body what it needs, you crave less, you feel better, your moods are stabilized, your blood sugar gets stabilized and life just takes on a whole new, um, you know, it's like putting on a brand new pair of the most amazing colored sunglasses you could, you know, just seeing everything brand new again. Well, because as women, right, we're always taught to eat like the boneless, skinless chicken breast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
And it's hard for people to get over that hump, but I've just, you know, it's similar with clients too, where once they start seeing like, oh, I'm still reaching my goals and I'm able to have red meat and have a burger and things like that, they're much happier. But I still see a lot of the times, even with clients that, you know, know it and are educated, it's like, oh, I just have two small meatballs, but I, I, I had extra veggies, but then I have the mask, like with each, you know, entry, how full were you after your meal? And it's like, oh, like I wasn't that full. And it's like, well, next time I want you to put two more meatballs on there, maybe another, you know, maybe a third if that's, because it really is, it gives you that satiating feeling. And I'm glad you brought up the micronutrients too, because even I know for myself, so I'm, I'm currently, um, entering my third trimester of pregnancy right now, Diana. And I mean, I've craved, even when I'm not pregnant, I crave red meat and a lot of the times it is like, I have to keep my iron levels up. And that's a part of it too, is having, you know, there's different, we have heme iron and non-heme iron in our plant foods versus our animal foods. Um, and the absorption rate is completely different. And that's something that's really important for women, especially too, when they're at points where they're trying to conceive Mm -hmm. or pregnant, or even postpartum is another really big one where, you know, I know super depleted. Oh, yeah. I know for my postpartum plan, I'm like, you know, going to be eating lots of red meat, also probably going to be taking a desiccated liver pill, really <laughs> trying to bring those nutrients back in. And, and I do, I feel for, um, anyone that is scared to eat red meat or scared to have more protein in general, because you're losing out at some of those points, um, mm-hmm. in your life as well. Yeah, I actually did a nutrient density challenge um, a couple of years ago, and I did a podcast about it. And that's where I got this idea for Eat Like a Nutrivore. But I tried to beat like all these other nutrition geeks with like the nutrients I was eating. And so <laughs> I was like, where can I get watercress and how much can I eat of this watercress? Because that's, you know, like one of the best things. Um, and I was shocked, even on the days when I had three servings of red meat, I was still Mm -hmm. not meeting my iron, um, RDA, uh, or DRI. And so, um, pulling in liver or a desiccated liver pill, um, absolutely critical for, um, women. And, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, pregnant women, um, and lactating women, um, and children through adolescence in a lot of countries, um, it is not recommended to be vegetarian or vegan. So in the U S um, our dietitians say that it is, but interestingly, every single person that was on that paper was a vegetarian or a vegan that wrote that paper. Um, so there's just a lot of bias going into all of this. And we just have, um, you know, food is a, is a highly charged topic and meat is the most charged of the foods because not only um, is it seen as unhealthy because of the saturated fat issue, but then you're pulling in, you know, cow farts killing the environment and it's wrong to kill beautiful cows where somehow yeah. it's a little bit better to kill chicken or fish. <laughs> um, but, uh, but don't kill a cow because that's the worst when, you know, a cow can provide almost 500 pounds of meat um, compared to how many chickens or fish would you need to kill for that? So, um, so one large ruminant grazing on land that can't be cropped, eating food we can't eat is actually, in my opinion, the most ethical animal source food you can possibly be eating. Yeah, no. And that's actually, you know what, let's dive into the environmental piece as well. And one mm-hmm. place I want to start because I think it's a big myth that, you know, right. Like it, again, it's the, one of those headlines, right? Like red meat causes cancer or meat causes cancer, processed meat, et cetera. And it's the other headline too, of cattle put out the most greenhouse gas emissions over transportation or over some of our other daily habits can we talk a little bit about that and how the results and how they present it are honestly, simply just flawed and not really comparing apples to apples? Mm -hmm, Definitely. So there's a couple of things with the greenhouse gas argument. So one is 
um, the methane generated from cattle is completely different than greenhouse gases from fossil fuels. Um, so cows are eating carbon. Grass is carbon. They're eating the carbon. They're, um, the bacteria in their guts are converting that to methane. Um, and the, the, the rest of the carbon is going into the cow and being turned into meat, which is carbon. And then we're eating carbon. Um, but the methane that goes into the atmosphere lasts about 10 years. It is a greenhouse gas. But then it um, it bonds with oxygen and turns into H2O, water, which is part of the rain cycle, um, and uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, which is then taken up by the plants. The plants release O2, oxygen, which is what we breathe. And then the rest of that carbon becomes grass again, roots, some of it gets built into new soil, sequestered in the ground. And so this is all flowing. This is a circle. Um, where when we're talking about transportation, fossil fuels, um, producing junk in China for Americans who just want anything they can possibly think of to order on Amazon for next day shipping, um, that is extracting ancient greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse uh, you know oils from locked in the earth's core and pumping it straight into the environment. And there is no cycle with that. So it's just getting burnt and it's introducing new carbon and methane to the atmosphere um, in a one way street. And so in the film, we have an animation that shows this. It's um, really good. <laughs> yeah. And I've got a poster about this. I've got infographics about it. So you can like visualize it. Yeah. And so that's the number one thing is that, you know, fossil fuels are, should be looked at differently than methane that's emitted from cattle that just gets reabsorbed by our, by our planet again. Right. Um, and then secondly, the way they have calculated out the, the people that are saying that cattle emit more methane than transportation, when they looked at, you know, cow farts basically, which are essentially cow burps, um, they were they were calculating everything within that process of the cow. So the producing the feed, transportation, um, you know, the, the cow actual, you know, farts and, and burps, um, but then also the processing and getting it to your table. But with transportation, there are no numbers on that. And so what they just were looking at for transportation was just tailpipe emissions from the car for example. So just what's coming out of the car, but nothing involved in extracting the oil, turning it into gasoline, building the car, mining yeah. all the minerals, the transportation, you know, from country to country of these cars to get them to where they are, all the plastics generated to make all the interiors for the car. None of that, just like it was in cattle, none of that was actually calculated for transportation. And so if we're going to um, look at just tailpipe emissions, um, for transportation, then we need to be comparing that just to the, the burps and the farts right from the cow. And, uh, so if you are comparing apples to apples, which it's still really not right, because yeah. their, um, their farts and burps are part of a cycle and transportation is not right. You know, like the cat, the car, once it releases all its gas, it's not like getting regenerated into a tree again or something. It's just going to a junk. It's not, you know, it's lost. Um, so cattle uh, worldwide are produce about 5% of man, quote unquote, man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is 14%. So, um, so yes, it is. Cattle do create methane, but um, it's part of a cycle. And uh, the greenhouse gases associated with transportation are not part of a cycle. And you know, finally, the last piece on this is that we don't have more methane producing animals today in North America than we did pre 1800s before we got rid of the bison. So that's just one last thing is we're actually not on a methane upswing. So, um, you know, before we came and, and messed everything up here in the US, uh, we had uh, millions and millions of bison, we had elk, we had deer, we had all kinds of animals that were all emitting methane. And today those animals are gone, but we have beef cattle and we don't have larger numbers today of beef cattle than we did. Um, so we don't have more methane than we did uh, before. Methane is not the problem. It's, it's uh, transportation and fossil fuels that's a problem. 
Well, and it's, you know, that leads me right into the benefit of that cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So then we have the CO CO2 then being sequestered into the soil. And what does that do? Which this is a this is something honestly, David, I probably only in the last year or so I've really tried to educate myself a little bit more on soil health. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did really, I don't know if you watched Kiss the Ground mm-hmm. on Netflix, but I thought that, you know, depicted a really it's a great starting point, right? Mm-hmm. Just to understand soil health and how that can, you know, and maybe really part of the key to a better health for our planet, right? Mm-hmm. Can we talk about how this life cycle, right? And having cattle graze and having them be a part of this life cycle, what it does to our soil and how that impacts every other crop and Mm -hmm. food we are eating. Yeah. So the idea between really healthy soil and uh, regenerative agriculture, it actually can't happen without animal input. So we can't have a vegan regenerative food system. It, it's impossible because you need something to fertilize those crops. Um, crops need to be, you know, there's, there's plowing involved. And even if there isn't plowing and they're doing um, uh, no, pl- no till, there's still often a lot of chemicals used in that um, fossil fuels used to drive the tractors, all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, when we're looking at grazing animals managed well, and we talk about the the good management cycle, I don't know if we're going to have a chance to get into that, um, in this podcast, because there's so many things to talk about, but, um, when they're moved properly, um, they're actually building brand new soil. And that's something that no crop can do. And they're making the soil, um, they're making the roots of the plant, of the grasses, really um, strong and vibrant. And then when they chomp on the grass, the the roots die back. But then that's how the the ground actually uh, builds new soil carbon because it's getting broken down by all the bacteria and the fungal networks. And then the roots are growing back again. We've got new soil building on top of it. And this healthy grassland is able to then absorb water much better than cropland, which um, will just, the rain comes down and it just runs right off and it takes with it all the chemicals and it goes right into our waterways with not only the top layer of soil, but also all the chemicals that were used on it. So when we have a healthy, rich pasture that has, uh, you know, deep rooted perennial grasses and, and, and the other plants that live in pasture, um, the water goes straight down. Um, and so it's able to actually absorb the rainfall. So it's not so much about the rain you get, it's the rain you keep. And we have a really good example about that in the film, um, showing that rainfall, uh, simulator, which is a really cool, tool. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty significant when you see it on the documentary, it's not just like a a little bit more water. It, it really keeps a significant amount. Um, and what would you say, Dana, for people listening that aren't that educated on soil health, if we don't increase the health of our soil and don't have right animals grazing and, and move towards more regenerative farming, what are the consequences of that? Um, another Dust Bowl, um, mm-hmm. quite frankly. Um, I mean, that's what the Dust Bowl was. Uh, that's that's what caused it in the first place is bad cropping. Um, and so um, so all these alt meat alternatives, you know, they're they're doing nothing to build soil health. Um, they can say that they use less emissions if you're looking at it in just that linear reductionist way with um you know, oh, well, we grew all these soybeans here and look, soybeans aren't emitting methane, but those cow farts are. Um, But those soybeans that are going in or pea protein or whatever Mm -hmm. is going into the lab meat, it's what pick your monocrop and and that's what's going to go in. There's no, there's nothing about ecosystem function that's benefiting from um, the production of factory meat and uh, lab form proteins. Yeah. And you know what, that actually leads into, let's talk a little bit about water usage Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the comparison between cattle Mm -hmm. versus plant foods. And just, I'm Mm -hmm. curious your opinion. 
Yeah. So I have a great infographic about this on my website too. Um, so there's different ways you can, ca- then you can calculate water, right? So there's, there's rain and there's water like in the environment, there's grass contains a lot of water. Um, and then there's water that we would drink that competes with us for drinking. Um, in the case of cattle, the majority, even in feedlot finished cattle, and this is where I'm not like advocating for feedlot finished cattle, but yeah. they have been vilified more than they should. Um, and they still are a great protein source for people that can't access the grass fed stuff. Um, uh, in the case of feedlot finished cattle, 94% of the water footprint for those cattle is green water is rain that would have fallen whether or not the cow was on that pasture. Um, In the case of grass fed, it's 97%. So it's not like these cows are just drinking, drinking, drinking out of aquifers that are then making it so our children don't have showers and drinking water, but that's how it's portrayed, right? If you don't eat that burger, then you're saving 10 bathtubs full of water. And that's completely not fair. That's not You know, you can't make a bathtub full of water out of the grass in my neighbor's yard. You can't do that, you know. Um, And when they're managed well, they're actually increasing the water cycle. And when they are drinking water, so the blue water is like when you're looking looking down on a map and, and you see blue, the lakes, aquifers, that would be competing with us for drinking water. When cat, when livestock uh, grazing animals get that, they're actually not just sucking it up and exploding blimps of water. They're actually peeing it back out again, um, which also just goes into the water cycle. So um, it, it's a lot different than flood irrigating almonds. And there are way more plant foods that are competing with us for drinking water than um, than you know cows eating grass. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. It's just not spoken about enough. And that's, you know, that's part of the reason why I feel so strongly, but also I'm so happy that we're able to educate people. And just also, it's a lot of stuff too, where this information isn't anywhere really, right? Like, unless honestly you're reading maybe, your guy's book, watching a documentary, it's, there's way more out there, right. In terms of the case for not eating meat. Um, and so hopefully the tides are, you know, are changing. Um, the last piece of the environmental part, I just want to touch on Diana is the land usage part. Mm -hmm. And you guys do a really good job in the documentary of, you know, just painting the picture of the real picture of what, the land usage taken up is and actually how having right cattle and other animals on those pieces of land actually benefits our planet. Yeah. So 60%. Oh, and I should mention too, before I dive into numbers, (laughs) that this is what won me my book contract. Um, uh, because, uh, I actually published with Ben Bella, which is the publisher of the China study. They're a vegan publisher. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, and he, when I talked to him about the book, he's like, well, you're never going to win an ethical argument. So, you know, whatever you want to say about ethics is fine, but you're just never going to win that um, with someone who's an ethical vegan. And, and the book is not written for ethical vegans anyway. It's yeah. not meant to sway them. Um, and he's like, well, you're going to win the nutrition case. Like, we know that. But the environmental case, that's where it is. And that's why we focused on that for the film. Um, And the land use piece is what really opened his eyes. And he was like, holy cow, I I had no idea, right? So so here's the thing. Most of, and we don't as Americans know this because when we fly over America and we look down, it's all cropland mostly, right? But you fly over the rest of the world and that's not how it is. There's not green squares and circles everywhere. And that's because most of our agricultural land is either too rocky, too hilly, too dry, uh, the soil's too poor to actually grow crops. And so 60% of our agriculture land is only able to be grazed. And so when we're hearing cattle take up way too much space, it's not like that space. It's just like the water argument. It's not like that space is going to be, you know, we take the cows off and we can grow more soy burgers. It's just not possible. And so if we don't utilize that grazing land, 
then nothing is going to be produced there. And it's not like rewilding it is really an option either because we don't have the large tracts of land required for a healthy herd movement. We don't have the predators. There's people living often near these places and they don't want their three-year-olds, you know, hanging out in the driveway with wolves circling around, you know. Um, and so rewilding is really a complete fantasy that is just absolutely not possible. Um, but what we can do is manage this land with grazing cattle um, and other grazing animals. And, you know, I don't think the whole world needs to be in cattle. Um, it depends on where you are. It might be camels yep. for a more arid area or goats. You know, they eat things that uh, cattle don't like cattle really love pastures. Goats really love, you know, shrubs and bushes and poison. They, they eat and anything, like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mean, goats will eat whatever, <laughs> but they actually aren't as happy if you just put them out on a field of grass, um, so as funny. sheep and, and cows are. So, um, it really just depends on the geography of the, of the area. But, um, you know, when you think of, um, you know, so many different places in the world, it's it also, the other thing is you can't crop year round in most places. You can in California, but not in Sweden, not in Norway, uh, not in Iceland. Um, yeah. But you you can you know graze things there. So yeah, um, it's it's so interesting. I'm so glad we got to spend so much time on the environmental piece because even like right like your book publisher was saying that is really the key piece that, and especially right now today, I feel like that has the most debate over it, but that people think is there's a clear answer, right? Um, so I'm just glad we we're able to open people's eyes. And then in terms of the ethical part, I did want to just start with some of the things I really liked from the documentary that I thought were so thought provoking for myself. Um, and then I, you know, I have friends that are vegans and, I, I think it would provoke the same thoughts for them, but, um, in the movie, and this is where, um, they are interviewing a butcher and his wife that mm -hmm. live in Berkeley. And she said so eloquently that, and she was saying as when she says, we themselves as the butcher and the vegans that we are answering the horrific ways of the conventional meat industry, but in different ways. So we're, we're answering to the same, you know, quote unquote, you know, if we want to say it's, it's an issue or problem, um, but just doing it in different ways. And I thought the way she said that I love one that it brings people together, right? It brings that it's not you're over here and we're over here, but really brings people together. Um, and then the other piece of it that I thought was really thought provoking was, and this was someone who was a, for anyone listening, who was a past vegan vegetarian, um, and then had her own health issues and started reintroducing meat. But she was really, you know, for the ethical piece of it and didn't want to kill animals. Um, and she realized that, you know, she didn't want to have anything to do with the death, but that soil has dead animals, dead bugs, dead insects, dead plants. So there's really no food you can eat that doesn't have death connected to it or have animal carcasses, right. Mixed up in the soil because farmers need that soil, right? Like they're bringing the animals to their soil to grow your vegetables because that's what's needed rather than having those cattle graze and, um, you know, actually practice more regenerative farming, which something, you know, I want to mention, so I don't forget, but I think is so powerful too, is sharing that the farmers seem to be doing so much better, right? Just for themselves and their families and their profits when they switch to a more regenerative farming practice. So, you know, with everything I just said, Diana, pick what you want to <laughs> highlight, but I just thought those pieces of the movie were so, um, you know, they can connect with anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you are the farmer, whether you are the vegan or vegetarian, or you're the butcher, um, or just your average person. I thought those were just such great parts of the film. Thank you. Yeah. And if we're, I mean, we're so polarized today, right? It's like herbal urban 
versus rural. I was going to yeah. say herbal. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if we want strong rural economies, which is healthy for our country, is to have like the middle of the country be really, really strong, we need less gigantic corporations owning our food and more small farmers producing our food. And when we go towards more Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, Lab Meats, that's actually going in the wrong direction. That's separating people more from their food producer than just going up the street and buying meat or um, buying a meat at a grocery store that's maybe sourced regionally from, from that area. Um, and so the, the real people benefiting from this plant-based movement is Wall Street are the investors um, who want to, you know, own the intellectual property to all of the patents. I mean, Impossible Burger has, I think, 11 patents. Um, th and right now, the United Nations is very close to adopting uh, the Eat Lancet diet. Uh, which will sort of mandate that all the countries in the United Nations move towards a more plant-based diet. There's only, um, you can eat about a blueberry's worth of red meat per day on this diet. Um, fish is really, re really small. Um, I think it's an eighth of an egg, uh, but, you know, lots and lots of grains. And not only is this, you know, completely elitist because this is being dictated out from, you know, really wealthy people in countries that have the privilege to push this away and have the access to whatever variety of plant-based foods that they can get. I mean, most of the world doesn't have, you know, gigantic grocery stores where they can get all the little coconut oil and goji berries that they need in order to have a well-planned plant-based diet, plus yeah. the supplements that they need for, I mean, I was just saying like iron is even hard when you're eating animal source foods. If you're not eating mm -hmm. Oregon meats, um, really, really difficult to get if you're not eating any animal source foods at all. Iron and B12 are the two leading nutrient deficiencies worldwide. Um, and we know that when children in their first thousand days get animal source foods from eggs and from, um, you know, meat that there's going to be less stunting. There's going to be better intellectual growth. Um, those countries are going to have stronger GDPs. I mean, we know that it only benefits them to eat more. And so I kind of question the ethics behind dictating to all of these other developing countries that they also need to be um, reliant on Western countries for their grains um, for their dietary policies that really are only appropriate if you have a lot of money and live in a place that produces a lot of grains. Um, you know, ethically also, um, there are a lot of places in the world where women can't own land, but they can own goats. Um, and these goats are not only providing nutrition for them and their families, but also, um, you can trade a goat and get some clothes for your kids to send them to the school, you know? So, uh, so a lot of people in poverty are actually reliant on livestock, not only for their primary nutrition, but also for, um, you know, their freedom from the patriarchy and from, uh, you know, just to be able to have some financial freedom. So I, I've worked a lot with Heifer International. Uh, they're doing amazing work in Nepal, like elevating women out of the poverty gap through livestock. So awesome. I, I have a major um, beef to pick with uh, Eat Lancet <laughs> and the United Nations not allowing any sort of pro-meat dialogue happening. Um, and so I'm starting this new organization called the Global Food Justice Alliance, which actually is just arguing for uh, food sovereignty, which is the idea that, you know, regions should be able to produce their own food independently, uh, culturally appropriate food in the most sustainable way. Um, and really just pushing back about, about this global, you know, push for a plant-based diet, which really is just putting money in the pockets of um, the shareholders of these large plant-based companies. Yeah, no. And it, it frustrates me, Diana, because again, it's not saying like, it's like, leave the meat on your plate. You want to add more vegetables. Yes. That's great. That's great for your gut health. Like we were talking about in the beginning of the podcast with your own story, but we don't need to take meat away in order to have a more because right. Even the term plant-based diet, right? Like the, it can mean so many things to so many different people, but 
leaving, you know, your meat and protein on your plate and add, yeah, add more vegetables if you want. But I see it as, you know, when we talk about like, you know, in the eighties when we got the recommendations to decrease our fat intake, right. And they increased carbohydrates and we saw what happened with that and the increase in obesity to me, this trend would only lead to, we'd see that decrease in vitality. We'd see that decrease in energy and people and productivity just from that lack of nutrients, right? Like just from those lacks of B vitamins, lack of iron. And like you said, I mean, most people around the world, even just, you know, being a part of the supplement industry can't afford most supplements, but there's also the education piece behind it too. You would have to educate people on how to get enough nutrients and protein well, from there's a, Yeah. There's a lot of places in the know? world where there is no, I mean, the, um, yeah. in the film, there's no doctors for hundreds of miles, let alone a CVS or a Walgreens where they can go get exactly. their supplement. So I think we just need to be really careful. Like, um, you know, if we have the privilege to, not eat meat and only eat fish. Great. It, and, and, yeah. um, supplement, you know, that's awesome. I take supplements, you know, yeah. but I'm not then forcing my ideologies on other countries as policy. I don't live there. I don't have their experience. And just because or like, their maybe, culture too, you know, right. Culture like, plays a big part. I mean, I watched my octopus teacher, right? Did you watch that documentary? No, I didn't. It made me really like, oh God, I don't know if I can eat an octopus now because <laughs> like he's this guy like falls in love with an octopus, right? It's, it's this documentary. And, but that doesn't mean that I have the right to go tell some other, um, you know, group that live on this Island that only live on octopus that they shouldn't eat it just because yep. I have a problem with it. I mean, it's, n- I don't get to do that. Right. Like I, no. I get to take my, my supplements and everything I want. And so, um, I think that people should have the power to, um, make their own food choices, but they also need to respect the powerless and, um, allow them to also have the power to make their own food choices. I a hundred percent agree. Um, okay. Last two quick things. One, I just wanted, cause I know we touched a little bit on it, Diana, but I also know now that you're having a course come on it, but can you just explain again, what eat like a Nutrivor means? Sure. Um, if people are wondering. Yeah. And I don't know when it's coming out probably, um, at some point this summer. So folks can just follow okay. me on Instagram or get on my newsletter list. Um, uh, we're just putting it all up right now. Um, but basically the idea is when you nourish yourself with not only the right amount of protein, but also the right amount of micronutrients, vitamins and minerals through real food as much as possible, you're going to just reduce your craving. So it's, it's actually kind of cool in that I'm teaching people how to not diet, right? Like yeah. I'm teaching people how to just naturally feel full Um, So in the beginning, there is some tracking just so that you can find out like, oh my God, how much stinking meat is she telling me to eat? Holy cow. Like, you know, because it's a lot, but it's also kind of cool to be on a diet where you're actually adding things Yeah. um, and also chasing nutrient goals, right? How can I get more copper? You know, what, what foods have copper and how can I get that? Like, I was like, I was, there was something in endives that I was lacking and I wanted to beat somebody on this nutrient <laughs> challenge that I was doing. Um, and so I like went to like three different stores looking for endives just so I could like get, you know, that in through food, you know? Um, and it also teaches you where you need to supplement, right? Because I think a lot mm-hmm. of people are taking supplements and they don't know why, or they don't remember why, or they heard maybe it was good from someone else, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, this will actually show you, okay, you're actually from your diet, you're not getting enough X, Y, Z. And so maybe you could start there, you know? Um, and so it's a diet that will help you balance your weight, whether, um, you know, some people, not everyone needs to lose. Some people need to gain. Um, and so it's just teaching you how to nourish yourself with real food, um, how to get off that diet roller coaster. It's not keto. It's not paleo. It's, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of diets that can work for people. Um, but I also think that it can be kind of neurotic, right. To like constantly be following some kind of dogma. And so this is just about, okay, you know, like here are some goals for you. Here's, so here's like a protein goal, go out and use your best judgment and hit it, you know, hit your protein. Yeah. So and it brings in that mindfulness of like, 
listening to your hunger cues, Mm -hmm. like just being in tune with your own body, because that is what I think so many diets just take out because people get regimented. Like if anyone asks me for a meal plan, you will not get one. (gasps) And the reason being is because they just follow it, right? They have blinders on and they follow it. And it takes away the human aspect of Mm -hmm. listening to your hunger cues, listening to your fullness cues, and also honoring what you may want in the moment. Like if you're craving, like, I mean, I'm going to use it because I feel like right now being pregnant, I'm always craving red meat, but like if you're craving red meat, there's probably a reason like, yeah, or, you know, little things like that. So I, I love that. Right. And when you're just presenting yourself with real food, Right. And, and, um, you know, so so like, okay, a craving for, um, goldfish crackers or a craving for soda may not be honoring what your body needs. Right. But when you're focusing on, do I crave watermelon or cantaloupe or grapes Mm -hmm. right now? Do I crave salmon tonight for dinner or am I look, you know, do I want some lamb? You know, like those are the types of choices that I'm empowering people to make, um, within the context of real food. And um, I'm also taking them through the environmental arguments and the ethical nice. arguments and also how to feed the world. Do we have the land for grass-fed beef? What policy changes need to happen? And how can you as a person live just a more sustainable lifestyle in general? Um, so it's really, I think just people want to feel better about their food and they want to yep. not be... Um, you know, go, going crazy on, on all these diets and just, you know, like, let me just kind of feel like a normal person again. And so, and I, I think most of the people that I'm working with are probably the same people that are listening to this podcast, um, probably just don't feel like they have that vitality that they used to have. And, um, you know, aging doesn't need to be, a painful, horrible process. Um, I still wake up every morning feeling really great. And, um, you know, I am the mom of two kids in high school. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I have more energy and, you know, better skin than I did when I was in my twenties. And so and I I, you're, you're everybody. living on a working farm too. So you're also well, I was living on a Oh, okay. Farm. You're not anymore. Yes. I actually went through a s- divorce during COVID. Oh, okay. Believe it or not. But I also, you know, that um, that experience, like I ate really well through it. I mean, divorce yeah. is really stressful. It's a really, really stressful process. I've met other um, people going through it too during this time. And, um, I see them like drinking excess alcohol, eating way too much food, all of this. Um, but if you have this baseline of real food and, um, you know, taking care of your body and prioritizing sleep and all these other things, then you can handle stress. You know, I'm not saying that it was easy, but it was certainly a lot better because of my diet and lifestyle. Yeah. And if people seek out that education, I mean, honestly, your course sounds great. Um, but people seek out that education and we're there, right. To tell them the why they have that knowledge and they have that basis to use it in yeah times of stress, but also just understand why they're making those choices for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Dan, I know we are out of time, but I do, we like to end every episode with a little rapid fire Q and a, so just okay. whatever comes to mind. Uh, okay. At first, first one is what is your favorite de-stressing practice or tool? Breathing. Nice. Just, uh, really focusing on my breathing. Um, I highly recommend the book breath. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but also just really, I, I, I've learned a lot about breathing over the last year for sure. Um, Diane, I love that you said that because we're actually recording in about an hour with James Nestor. Ah, you tell him I said hello. <laughs> real friend, I'm, I will. Yes. <laughs> I will. I'll tell him we just had you on. Um, okay. Next question. Coffee or tea? Tea. Any preference on what kind of tea? Uh, right now I am drinking a, a detox tea from Yogi, cool. but in the morning I switch between um, an English breakfast tea or mm. a Russian caravan, which is like a smoked, oh. a really strong smoked tea. Um, never had that or honestly heard of it. Yeah. It's really, really good. It's very smoky. So it's kind of intense for the morning, but I am a tea drinker all the way. 
Love that. Okay. And then this is my favorite question, but favorite home cooked meal. You know, I will take a whole roasted fish over anything, any time of day, anywhere. If there's whole roasted fish on the menu, I will get it. (laughs) Um, And yeah. So number one would be just any kind of whole roasted fish in the oven. It's not that scary. Um, you can watch a video guys on how to do it. And it's just like cooking the fish with the bones on it. I'm just a crazy seafood fan. So, um, I guess steak would probably be a second, but, um, fish is my number one. No, love that. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, Diana. And I just want to leave with two, where can people follow Mm -hmm. you, connect with you and hear about like, is there a place they can sign up to receive more information about your Mm -hmm. course coming out? Yes. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so I'm on social media, most active on Instagram and it's at sustainable dish. Um, uh, the film people can find out more info on that at sacredcow.info, not sacredcow.com, which is a, like a, a film production company. Um, but sacredcow.info, I will be starting the global food justice Alliance very soon. I'm actually looking at a uh, logo and, and web comps for that later on today. Um, so just, uh, people can get involved with that if they want to help me, um, you know, advocate. It's really an advocacy website, um, backed by, uh, academics and dietitians and, uh, doctors. Um, and then sustainabledish.com is my nutrition website. And, um, that's, you know, where you can find stuff on my clinical practice working with me. And also that's where my course stuff will be. And so you can sign up for my newsletter probably through any of those places too. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you so much again. Um, and everyone go check Diana out, go check. Honestly, I would say I loved the film, but the book to me was gold. The book is much deeper than the film. Yeah. The film is just like a tasting menu of the book. Yes. But you know, do what you can. If you're not into reading right now or don't have the time, at least check out the film, um, and bookmark this podcast. Thank you so much.